Okay, uh, thanks everybody for making it out today. Uh, today our speaker is Mike Tate uh, from Villanova University who will be talking about spectral Turan problems. Go ahead and take us away, Mike. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I have a, I'm wearing this shirt. I have a soft spot for uh, South Carolina ever since my, my friend played soccer for South Carolina. So she gave me the shirt 15 years ago and ever since then, um, yeah, I, I feel, I feel uh, good about South Carolina. And so, uh, wait, can you guys see my screen? Okay, here we go. And so, um, yeah, since then I call, I definitely am team the real USC here. So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna tell you about, um, here, let me move this so I can see you and see my screen at the same time. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about spectral Turan problems. Um, feel free to stop me or interrupt or, or whatever. Um, so I'm gonna talk about spectral Turan problems and uh, I wanna start by talking about Turan problems. Um, this is sort of the main function in extremal graph theory. So it's uh, the Turan number for a graph. So the idea is you, you have a forbidden graph F um, and you're playing this optimization game. So you wanna maximize the number of edges in an N vertex graph. Uh, and you're subject to the constraint that you don't see F as a subgraph. So it's, it's an optimization subject to a constraint. Uh, so for example, this is the densest triangle free graph that you can have on nine vertices. Um, it has uh, 20 edges, I guess, and, and there's no triangle in there and you can sort of check that you, you can't do better than this. And um, you can see there's no triangle because it's a bipartite graph, right? So like I, um, you can see it in two ways, right? Like there's by the pigeonhole principle, if you take any three vertices, then one of them ha has a, uh, uh, or two of them have the same color, and so there's no edge between those two. Or you can see it, this is a bipartite graph, so it's two colorable. And so any subgraph of it is also two colorable, which means that uh, there's no triangle in there. And this is generalizable. Um, you can kind of see that this construction, a complete bipartite graph, is, um, has no triangle. So it gives you a lower bound on this optimization problem. It's a construction. So uh, it gives you a lower bound for the maximum. And Mantel's theorem is essentially that you can't do better than that. So that's the content of Mantel's theorem is that if you have one more edge than this, uh, then you have a triangle. And Mantel's up proves something slightly stronger that this is the only extremal graph. So, so if you really have a graph that has the maximum number of edges, then it's a complete bipartite graph and the parts are balanced. Okay, and uh, Turan generalized this. You can see the, the construction is sort of obvious how to generalize. I'll take uh, an R partite graph. So each part has size N over R. And um, this, you can see that it has no KR plus one, again, from the pigeonhole principle or from this graph is R colorable. So it has no, um, any of its subgraphs are also R colorable. So, so this gives me a lower bound for my Turan number uh, for bidding KR plus one. And the content of Turan's theorem is that it's also an upper bound. And Turan's theorem also gives this stability result that for n large enough, if, uh, if you really have a graph that's KR plus one free that has this many edges, then it's a complete multi-partite graph that's balanced. Okay, and this is generalized to graphs if I'm forbidding an arbitrary graph of chromatic number R plus one, again, the construction is the same. And you, you, see, you see from not the pigeonhole principle anymore, but from uh, the chromatic number argument that this graph has no subgraphs of chromatic number R plus one. So uh, th this graph has roughly one minus one over R times N squared over two edges, and uh, it's, it's G free. And so it, uh, it it gives me a lower bound for this number. And this kind of cell, this Erdős Stone theorem is a, a really strong theorem. It shows that that's also an upper bound for a, an arbitrary forbidden graph of chromatic number R plus one. So this is um, really nice. It gives us a, an asymptotic formula for this problem most of the time. Um, the only time that it, it doesn't asymptotically solve the problem is when this term is zero. So when R is one then we don't have an asymptotic formula anymore. And this just says that the, the Turan number is little o n squared in that case. And so if my forbidden graph is bipartite, then um, we don't really know what's happening, at least by this theorem. And, and in the case that the, the um, 
forbidden graph is not bipartite, then we have this nice asymptotic formula. Uh, and when when the when the forbidden graph is bipartite, the problem is like very fundamentally different. Um, there's the the, the Erich Stone theorem says that the, the Turan number of a bipartite graph is little o n squared, but you can actually do much better like this. The, the Turan number of, of any bipartite graph is really sub, uh, sub quadratic um, because of this Kervari Church Turan theorem that says um, the Turan number of a complete bipartite graph is bounded above by something that looks like n to the 2 minus 1 over s. And so since any graph f, like if I have a bipartite graph f here, F is contained in a suitably large complete bipartite graph. And so its Turan number is bounded above by the Turan number of that graph. Uh, and so, okay, so we sort of have this like dichotomy between these problems where if the chromatic number of my forbidden graph is at least three, then I have these nice constructions that asymptotically solve the problem. They're product like. What I mean by that is there's sort of a, a small number of sets of vertices and how a vertex behaves only depends on what set it's in um, for the most part. So if, if I'm forbidding uh, something that's not a complete graph, the, the extremal graphs are not quite uh, complete multi-partite graphs, but up to little o n squared edges they are. So if you kind of like take a step back, it looks like a product-like construction. Um, when the forbidden graph is bipartite, not only is the Turan function very different, but the extremal graphs are also very different. So um, in the cases that we sort of know what's happening when I forbid a bipartite graph, uh, you, have these, you have these constructions that come from geometry and algebra and projective planes and generalized polygons and things like that. Um, and they look uh, a lot different than a complete multi-partite graph. So generally these, these constructions of extremal graphs for forbidden bipartite graphs, they look, uh, they're, they're described in an algebraic way. They, uh, they look sort of pseudo random in a certain sense. You can quantify what that means. Um, it's, it's not at all like, uh, like a Turan graph. So they, so they really look very different. Okay, so, I, so that's kind of the extremal graph theory part. I wanna do a spectral version of this extremal graph theory problem. So in spectral graph theory, the goal is to associate a matrix with your graph and then properties of the matrix you want to deduce properties of the graph from that so basically i'm going to give you some matrix that's corresponding to your graph you can compute its eigenvalues and eigenvectors and from those eigenvalues and eigenvectors i want to say oh well my graph must look like whatever like some properties of my graph so in in this talk i'll consider the adjacency matrix there are lots and lots of matrices um, that you can associate with a graph. The adjacency matrix is maybe the most well-studied one, and, and that's what I'll be focused on. This matrix is a, an n by n matrix. If I have a graph with n vertices, um, it is a zero one matrix. You, you put a one in the ij entry if vertex i is adjacent to vertex j, and otherwise you put zero. So it's this nice zero one matrix. It is symmetric. So if you notice this definition, um, is is symmetric and in, in terms of i and j a sub i j is equal to a sub j i and when you have a real symmetric matrix that has these very nice properties in particular it has a full set of real eigenvalues and real eigenvectors um the the eigenvectors you can take them to be an orthonormal an orthonormal basis of rn and these properties are very nice when you're trying to use linear algebra to say something about about your graph. And so um, this matrix is very nice for the reason that you can use uh, these big linear algebra theorems to prove graph theory theorems, essentially. Okay. And so you, you, you have these eigenvalues. You always have this full set of eigenvalues. And so you want to know something about your graph from this set of eigenvalues. OK, so this is kind of the the spectral version of the Turan problem. So, so the question is, um, I want to give you a graph. The same thing, I'm going to forbid f. So I'm looking at f-free graphs. And now the, the Turan problem was maximize the number of edges. Uh, now I'm going to say, I want to maximize the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. So I'm, I'm maximizing the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix of the, of the graph. OK, so this question was. Um, 
kind of a more general version of this question was first posed by Buraldi and Solhide. They, these are called Buraldi Solhide problems. Um, there are questions that maximize lambda one over some family of graphs. So any question that's of that form, it's kind of a very general question. You take a family of graphs and I wanna know which one in that family has the largest spectral radius. Um, so you can think of like Stanley's bound is uh, uh, maximizing lambda one over the family of graphs that has M edges, for example. So that's a, that's kind of a classical um, example of this type of theorem. Um, and the family that we're maximizing over in this case is the family of N vertex F free graphs. And to that end, I'll define this, this function, the spectral extremal number of uh, my graph F. And so it's the, the maximum spectral radius over all N vertex F free graphs. And uh, usually people use uh, capital EX to, note, to denote the family of extremal graphs in the Turan problem. So the family of graphs that have the maximum number of edges and are F-free. And I'll use the same, same kind of notation. I'll use capital S-B-E-X to denote the family of spectral extremal graphs. So I may, during this talk, I may say edge extremal or Turan extremal to talk about this family. And I may say spectral extremal to talk about this family. Okay, so why ask this question? Um, and, and I guess really what I wanna say in this slide is, is I want to explain why I'm calling this a spectral Turan problem. So, you know, the, the, the um, questions sort of look the same, but are they really related? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, the spectral radius of a graph is related to the number of edges in the graph. So um, somehow these two questions are capturing, capturing similar information about the graph. Um, I'll show you sort of how the spectral radius is related to the number of edges as a lower bound as an, and as an upper bound. So, so one of the really nice things about uh, adjacency matrices is that the, 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 and it's particularly the, particularly the largest eigenvalue of an adjacency matrix is that you can think of it as an optimization problem. So this is called the Rayleigh quotient, this uh, X transpose AX over X transpose X. And it turns out that the spectral radius of uh, of a graph is given by the maximum over this Rayleigh quotient. You can see this because, um, I mean, it follows because there is a full set of eigenvectors. Uh, so you can kind of expand X as a linear combination of eigenvectors and then, and then bound every, uh, every eigenvalue by the largest one. Essentially, that's how it works. And so um, it, this is sort of gives you a, it gives you another way to think about the spectral radius of a graph. It's some information about the graph that's in terms of a different optimization problem. Um, a corollary of this is that the spectral radius of a graph is an upper bound for the average degree of a graph. Because uh, if I, you know, I'm, I'm taking the maximum over all vectors here, if I take X as the all ones vector, and then when I do this X transpose AX, um, you can, what happens when X is the all ones vector is every edge is just counted twice. And so you get twice the number of edges and the, the, the length of, of this one transpose one is N. And so this is exactly the average degree of your graph. And so you get this very nice bound um, that, that uh, if I tell you the spectral radius of a graph, it, it, this really immediately tells me something about the graph. It tells me something about the density of the graph. Uh, the, there's also an upper bound in terms of uh, the degrees. And to see that you sort of look at the eigenvector eigenvalue equation. So you look at it as a, well, it's a matrix equation, but you look at it as a system of equations. So you have this matrix equation. And you can think about it as a system of equations for, for every kind of uh, uh, row here, there's an equation. And so what this says is when I, when I expand that row, so and expand this this row dot x is is this uh, lambda times this entry. I get I get this equation, and so you can kind of think about it as like I mean what's happening here is you have you have this x u, and um, the entry here has to um, sort of be an average scaled by lambda of the entries of of its neighbors, right? So so it's kind of this like dynamical system, um, and I mean, this tells you something about, about this lambda one. It, it's constrained by this process where, where uh, every vertex sort of has to have its neighbors um, 
its neighbors being equal to a scaled version of its own entity. And if you look at uh, if you look at this where I look, if you look at kind of this picture where I take this to be the maximum eigenvector entry, then um, you, okay, you get a, a sum over the neighbors of this vertex of the eigenvector entries. Each one is bounded by the maximum. And uh, th this sum is bounded by the, the degree of u times the, times the maximum eigenvector entry. And so you get the spectral radius times the maximum eigenvector entry is at most the degree of that vertex times the maximum eigenvector entry. And so you get an upper bound of uh, the maximum degree for the spectral radius here. Right? So you, you now have these, these two bounds that, for example, when the graph is regular, this, this tells you that immediately. Right? So, so um, the spectral radius is sort of bounded between the average and the maximum degree. If those are close together, then you have a lot of information. If they're far apart, then it's not so clear what's happening. But um, since the spectral radius is related to the degrees in this way, uh, it, it sort of makes sense to ask this about, uh, to, to call this a spectral parameter, let's say. Um, I'll just say that you can play the same game with, like we, we, um, we found out something about the spectral radius by, by looking at the eigenvector eigenvalue equation for A. And we looked at kind of this, the entry of the vertex uh, as compared to the entries of its neighbors. But you can do the same thing with larger powers of the matrix. So you get this kind of eigenvector eigenvalue equation where this is now lambda to the k times x. And what's happening is you're, you're sort of, you have uh, this vertex and its entry needs to be a scaled version of when you kind of take walks of length k and you look at what's happening at the end of, at the end points of walks uh, of walks of length k because a to the k sort of counts these walks of length k right and so you can you can sort of play the same game and ask well can I get structural information about the graph from looking at um, higher moments of the spectral radius basically. And the answer is yes. And you can actually prove some uh, like several theorems using this kind of setup. So you can prove Mantel's theorem, you can prove Stanley's bound, you can prove some um, stronger versions of Stanley's bound and, and a couple other things. So it's, it's, um, it's sort of surprising that kind of this, this uh, sequence of eigenvalues should tell you so much information about the structure of your graph, but it, it turns out that it does. Okay, so I want to say what kind of spectral uh, Turan theorems have been proved before. So one of the big ones was by Nikki Forov uh, in the early 2000s, and he, he said that, okay, if, if my forbidden graph is the complete graph, then uh, the, the spectral radius of this graph is bounded above by the spectral radius of the Turan graph. So this is the complete R partite, complete balanced R partite graph, the Turan graph. So this Turan graph was the, the edge extreme, extremal graph. If I want to forbid KR plus one and maximize the number of edges, then I should choose this graph. And Nikki Foros theorem says that also it's the spectral extremal graph. So if I want to forbid KR plus one and maximize the spectral radius of my graph, then also I should choose this complete multi-partite graph. So it's kind of this like product-like construction. We also, um, oh, and so since, since the spectral radius is an upper bound on the average degree, any upper bound on the spectral extremal number of a graph automatically gives you an upper bound on the, on the extremal number of a graph. So this, one of the motivations for doing this kind of study is that it can actually, um, it, it can imply Turan type results and it can actually even strengthen Turan type results. So this implies that the number of edges in an extremal graph is actually less than the number of edges in a Turan graph. You, you have to be a little bit careful with the parity of n and stuff, but um, this theorem actually implies Turan's theorem. It's stronger than Turan's theorem. Um, he also proved a, a spectral version of the curvary church turan theorem, and, and his spectral version of the curvary church turan theorem actually implies the best known edge version of the curvary church turan theorem. So it is, his theorem implies Fioretti's improvement of the curvary church turan theorem. So these are kind of two um, sort of motivating theorems that show you why you might want to prove something like this, because you can, you can prove stronger versions of classical theorems. Okay, so I want to um, 
give kind of an overview of what's happening in the edge extremal case and in the spectral extremal case. So if we kind of the, the um, first thing that you should study is forbidding, forbidding KR plus one. So Tehran's theorem says, take a complete multi-part type graph. And Nikki Forov's theorem says also take a complete multi-part type graph of, of balance sizes. So these are the same, the same. Uh, what about an odd cycle? So a triangle or even a, a larger odd cycle. Um, it's, it's known that the, the edge extremal graph, as long as N is large enough, the edge extremal graph is a complete bipartite graph. And um, Nikiforov also, or actually some, I mean, I think this was known before Nikiforov, but um, it's also known that the spectral extremal version of this problem, if I forbid uh, an odd cycle, then as long as N is large enough, the spectral extremal graph is also a complete, a complete bipartite graph on an even, uh, on a balanced number um, of parts in each, in each part. Um, and so again, the answers are the same. Um, in this talk, I'm always going to think about n being large enough. Like there's, you know, some some strange things might happen if I'm forbidding a long odd cycle and n is small, then this is not extremal. But I, I want to I want to know what happens if n is getting really large. Okay, so when I forbid a complete graph, the answers are the same. When I forbid uh, an odd cycle, the answers are the same. So maybe it's the same problem, but um, it turns out that it's not. And um, the answer, well, it's not clear from this example, but this is actually sort of what motivated my work in this, um, on this topic. I was sort of trying to maximize spectral radius of planar graphs and outer planar graphs. And, uh, you know, planar graphs have these nice characterizations that they don't have certain minors. And so I was trying to maximize spectral radius overall KR minor free graphs. And this question is that there's a, um, there's a natural KR minor free graph. So if I take a, a complete graph on R minus two vertices and I join it to an independent set, then this has no KR minor. Um, and it, it, this is kind of the natural version. And um, it, it turns out that this is, the, this is the spectral extremal graph if N is large enough. Um, and and uh, that's a theorem that um, I proved with Josh Tobin and a few years ago, five years ago or so. And um, for the for the edge extremal question, it's it's not clear. So so this is a conjecture of of Seymour that the same thing should be true, and it's true when R is um, at most six or at most seven or something like that. I um, mean, it's conjectured that by Seymour that for fixed R, if n is large enough, then this is the extremal graph. But it, it seems difficult to prove. People don't know how to prove this. Um, you might say, well, okay, did the spectral theorem uh, imply this one, right? So that would kind of be, that would be really good. But unfortunately, um, this does give you an upper bound. The spectral theorem gives you an upper bound on the number of edges in a KR minor free graph, but um, it's not good in this case. So basically this graph is very far from being regular. And so the, uh, the very large degrees make it so that the spectral radius is far away from the average degree. So, so unfortunately, this spectral theorem, it doesn't really tell you anything about the edge extremal version. But um, yeah, that's sort of one of the motivations of studying these things. OK, so this is an example where we know the spectral extremal graph, but we don't know the edge extremal graph. Um, C4 free graphs, so this is an example where um, in some sense, we know more about the spectral version. And this is an example where the, the extremal graphs are very different, actually. So you can check. So, so um, the edge extremal graphs for C4 come from projective planes. There are these graphs with um, that are very close to regular. They're highly pseudo-random. The degrees are roughly n to the 1 half. Uh, and you can check that. Um, the spectral radius of a C4 free graph is also bounded above by something like n to the one half. So it's, it's very close, like it's one times n to the one half plus something of lower order. And so you can ask, well, are the extremal graphs the same? Um, but it turns out they're not, even though the projective plane graphs and the actual spectral extremal graphs, they have very, very similar largest eigenvalue, but they look completely different. So the, this was a conjecture of Nikki Forov that was proved not too long ago, I think like maybe 10 years ago or something that the graphs uh, maximizing spectral radius over C4 free graphs are the friendship graphs. 
So you take uh, just triangles intersecting on a vertex. Um, and this is true for all n. So it's, it's harder to show when, um, I guess the number of vertices is even because you have this extra edge sticking out, um, but it's, it's true for all n. The extremal graphs for the edge case are, they're not known um, all the time. So they're known in certain situations when we know things about projected planes and stuff like that, but they're not known all the time. So this is an example where we know um, more about the spectral case than, than the edge case, but, but kind of we um, sort of understand them both pretty well. Okay, what about C2K free? So this is um, a really difficult question in the edge case. And it turns out it's also a really difficult question in the, in the spectral extremal case. So the conjecture, um, the conjecture for the right-hand side here is that I should take, so if I want to forbid C2K, I think I take a, a complete graph on K minus one vertices, mostly joined with an independent set. And then I, I put in one extra edge here maybe. Um, but we don't know, this is true. So this is true for uh, C6 um, and it's unknown for the other cases. So this is a conjecture of Nikki Forov. The, the proof for C6 is, is pretty recent. Like it's just maybe a year ago. Um, and uh, it, it seems quite difficult to prove it in general, um, but it, it seems maybe more tractable than the, than the edge case. We really don't know what's going on here. So, um, we don't even know kind of the order of magnitude of what's happening, except in very in certain cases. So when I'm forbidding C4, C6, C10, then we have some understanding of what's happening. And, and the other cases we don't. And the extremal graphs, they look very different in this case. So here, we're, we're also kind of looking at these when we know what the, or let's say the best constructions that we know, they look like these generalized polygons, basically. Um, but yeah, both sides now, we don't know what's happening basically. Um, and then here, this is another case where we sort of have no idea what's happening. Um, I don't even have a conjecture as to what's happening here the, uh, uh, on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, the edge extremal graphs, we know it depends on the value of S and C. So if T is much larger than S, then you can use these projective norm graphs, which again, they're kind of, the graphs coming from geometry. So it's the intersection of some surfaces or something. And so because of that, the the graphs look very pseudo random, basically. Um, not at all like this product type construction. Um, there's not even a guess on the right hand side what this should be like. I don't even have intuition for, for what the extremal graph should be like. Okay, and that's kind of like, I wanna um, talk about intuition. So how can you guess what the extremal graph should be like? How, how is this function behaving? We saw that kind of sometimes it's the same Graph, the, the same extremal graphs as the as the prime case. Sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes it's very different. Um, here, here the graphs are very different, but the the spectral radius and the average degree are very close together in the two in the two examples, even though the graphs are very different. Here, um, that's not the case. So the the spectral radius here is is much bigger than the average degree on the on the left. Um, even though the graph is much less dense, actually. And here, we don't know. Okay, so, so that's kind of like the overarching question here is, when are these questions the same? Um, how can we decide what we think the extremal graph should be? Uh, and how can we go about proving those things? And so that's kind of um, big picture what's happening. And I kind of want to say, uh, some things that we know by looking at a few specific graphs where we were able to answer this question. Okay, so one thing to notice is that the, the functions that you're trying to optimize, they just incentivize slightly different things. So the edge, uh, the edge problem asks you to maximize the number of edges, right? So it's just every edge that you have is, is one more and um, every edge counts the same amount. So you just wanna maximize this. Here, the spectral radius, you're trying to maximize this sort of weird quadratic form. And it turns out if you, if you think about this a little bit, like not all the edges are the same. It helps me to add edges to vertices that already have lots of edges. So we kinda wanna, um, it, it helps to concentrate the edges on one vertex or on a small set of vertices more than, than um, 
more than in the edge case, the, the distribution of the edges in the, in the edge case, it doesn't matter at all. Um, and here you have the max, you know, it's, it's something different that's happening. Okay, so I want to look at this when I forbid a few different things. So the, so the first one is I want to forbid the friendship graph now. So FK is this friendship graph on a fixed number of triangles. The other way to think about it is this is a vertex that has K edges in its neighborhood. Okay, so that's, that's kind of one way I want to think about this. Um, there's a, the edge version of this problem was solved in the 90s. Uh, the extremal function looks like this. So kind of even though the Erdős Stone theorem tells us the asymptotics of it, you can still ask more specific questions. It's it's um, still interesting to try to figure out what exactly is the the exact Huron uh, function number and and what are the extremal graphs. And so here, um, this group of people determine determine these. And the, the extremal graphs sort of look like this. It depends if k is odd or k is even, but let me do k is odd. Basically, you put a large complete bipartite graph. Okay, so that's this term. And then I, I just, I want to put um, two complete graphs of size k, two di disjoint complete graphs of size k. And so right now, I want to think of n as going to infinity. So what this means is essentially the graph is a complete bipartite graph, and I'm putting just a small number of extra edges here. Okay, so that's how I want to think about these extremal graphs. Um, and uh, so, so k is a constant here, and then it's going to infinity. And um, it, it turns out that in this case, maybe it's not so surprising when the edge when the edge extremal graphs were complete bipartite graphs, then also the spectral extremal graphs were complete bipartite graphs. And and the first thing I want to say is that's true in this case as well. So if you have a spectral extremal graph, it has this many edges. It has this many edges. And um, I think there is kind of a general thing that's true here is that uh, anytime the edge extremal graph is a Turan graph plus a constant number of edges, then this should be true. The spectral extremal graph should be also have the maximum number of edges over all F3 graphs. Um, yeah, I'll explain why I think this, this is true um, in a bit, but I, I think this is true in general. This is actually sort of interesting. Like you, you may have a, like, I think it's even possible to prove this if you don't know what the edge extremal graphs are. So you could, you could, you know, possibly know that the edge extremal graph satisfy this property, but not know exactly what the extremal graphs are. And I think still this is true and potentially you could even prove it even if you don't know what the extremal graphs are. Um, one, uh, one version of this theorem when you replace the O1 by zero is that, uh, so if I have a color critical graph, then it's known that for N large enough, this is an old theorem of Shimonovitz, if, if, if you have a, a color critical graph, then for N large enough, the extremal graph is just a Turan graph. And uh, Nikki Forov showed that this is true in the spectral problem as well. So when I, this conjecture is true in those cases. Okay, and the other graph that I wanna look at is a, a wheel on T vertices. So it's a, it's a, it's a vertex that has a cycle of blank T minus one in the neighborhood, the wheel on T vertices. Um, notice that if uh, T minus one is even, then this wheel is four chromatic and it's color critical. And so this theorem applies. So the edge extremal graph and the spectral extremal graph in this case uh, is just a, uh, a three part type graph, complete three part type graph. On the other hand, if the total number of vertices is odd, then the, the cycle inside the neighborhood is even. And so it's a three chromatic graph and it's not critical. And so the, the, these theorems don't apply. And so um, we, we want to ask this question for, for uh, in this case. The Turan version of this problem was solved quite recently. So um, for k equals two, this was solved uh, in 2018. And the extremal graphs look like this. You take a, make this slightly bigger. You take a complete bipartite graph and you put a matching in both sides. Put a matching in both sides. Um, you can check if I have a complete bipartite graph and I put uh, a vertex of degree two on top, internal degree two, then you'll have a you'll have a wheel on five vertices. And that's kind of how I want to think of these constructions as sort of we know like asymptotically what the extremal graphs look like. 
So I really want to think of it as if I start with a complete bipartite graph, then what, what else am I allowed to add? It's not trivial to show that that's actually the case. That's where all the work is, but that's kind of the intuition that you should have. Um, the, when, when K is bigger than two, the structure changes of the extremal graphs. So when K is bigger than two, what you want to do is take a complete bipartite graph on not quite balanced, but close. And what I want to put up here is like up here, I'm basically, I'm not allowed to have a vertex of internal degree K and I'm not allowed to have a path on two K minus one vertices. So for example, I can just put, let's say disjoint copies of, of K K in here. And then I want to put a single edge on this side. If n is not divisible, if the, if the part size here is not divisible by k, then you have to do something slightly different. But let's just assume for for simplicity that it is. So you kind of the, the structure changes in, in the W five case. Like there's significantly many edges on both sides, and then in the larger wheels case, there's the edge the internal edges only come on one side. Okay, so our theorem is this is a joint work with Sebi and uh, our PhD student Dikhil Desai and. Our, our theorem is that in the W5 case, the extremal graphs are the same. So, so the extremal graph is this in the spectral case. Um, but when K is bigger than six, they're actually disjoint. So um, we basically, we show that the extremal graphs have very similar structure to here. Like it, it still is true that the extremal graph is roughly a complete bipartite graph. And it still is true that you should sort of put this one edge here and put these something here that doesn't create this wheel. Uh, something with a linear number of vertices here that doesn't create this wheel. So this is still true, but um, the, the size of the parts are not the same actually. So somehow like the structure is very similar, but the families themselves are actually disjoint. So here you, you, you have some, you can do calculus sort of to maximize this um, and the part sizes are slightly off from each other. And here, um, it actually is a little bit confusing, like it depends on parity of n and stuff like that, but um, the, the sizes are closer together. Let's say they're off by at most two. Um, for k is uh, three, so for w7, it's also the case that the extremal graphs are the same. And we don't, act, we don't know for k is four and five, there's sort of one, it, they should be the same, but there's one technical detail that um, there's a lemma that doesn't go through and we don't know how to fix it. Okay, so let me sort of briefly say, how do you prove something like this, right? So let's say we have a graph that we think might be extremal. Um, you, you kind of, uh, yeah, you, you sort of go in stages uh, showing that your graph is closer and closer to this extremal graph. So you automatically have a lower bound on this spectral radius, right? Like you, if you have a graph you think is extremal, the spectral radius of that graph gives you a lower bound on this parameter. And that constrains what your extremal graphs look like, right? If I know my spectral radius is at least n over two, then I know a decent amount about my graph. I know it's fairly dense. I know it doesn't have this f, and so you can sort of say some things about it. Once you have kind of rough structure of our graph, then you can say something about the eigenvectors of the graph. Like the structure tells you something about the eigenvector entries, and the eigenvector entries also tell you something about the structure. So you can kind of sort of bounce back and forth between structural information and eigenvector information. And you sort of can get more and more precise information until you are close enough to your graph. And then potentially you can alter to show that um, you have some sort of stability result now, basically. Like you can alter to show that the, the graph is actually what you think it is. Okay, so let me just remind you, when, when I'm forbidding a friendship graph, I'm aiming for a complete bipartite graph plus a constant number of edges, two small cliques in there. When I'm forbidding a wheel on five vertices, I'm aiming for a complete bipartite graph plus a matching in each part. And when I'm aiming for a wheel on a larger number of vertices, I'm aiming for a complete bipartite graph with kind of a spanning let's say spanning K regular graph on one side and a single edge on the other side. So that's, that's kind of what I'm aiming for. You notice that if, if I take a step back from all of these constructions, they all look like complete bipartite graphs. So that's kind of, the details are sort of to show that, yeah, this complete bipartite graph is really there. Um, and once you kind of know the complete bipartite graph is there, then you can try to argue that what's inside satisfies these properties that you, that you think it does. 
Um, so let's kind of think about how does this work in this specific case. Um, this is kind of a, a broad outline of what's happening. I want to say, I want to show you how to do something like this. So, so um, this is kind of this piece, this piece of the argument. So you have this lower bound and that tells you kind of roughly what the graph looks like. And so in these cases, you, you have a lower bound of n over two. This tells me that um, I'm close to a complete bipartite graph. So, so the goal here is to show I, I am this complete bipartite graph plus some other things. The first part of this is kind of like to get an approximation of that. I wanna say I, I have um, a very large maximum cut. So kind of if I take a step back from the graph, it looks like a complete bipartite graph. Um, after that, you sort of uh, show that, okay, I'm gonna do this more precise argument, okay? So I wanna, I wanna give some details of this because I think it's, um, it's nice to see how you can argue that the, the extremal graphs in the spectral case and the edge case uh, are similar, okay? Because that's not always the case, right? Like some of, some, of these, some of these problems, the two families are completely different, um, but when they're the same, like, if you think they're the same, how do you show this, right? So this is, this is kind of the details that I want to give you right now. So first is to get a lower bound on the, on the spectral radius. Okay, this one's easy. If I have a complete bipartite graph, then the spectral radius of this graph is n over two. Let's say n is even. Um, so it's, it's n over two, the graph is regular. And, and there's no f in this graph, of course. So, so this is a lower bound. So whatever my extremal graph is, it has lambda one is at least n over two. Okay, now um, we need a structural lemma. Okay, so this is a, a statement that's true in any graph. The number of edges in any graph is bounded below by um, this function of the spectral radius and the number of triangles. Okay, so what that means is that if the spectral radius is large and if the number of triangles is small, then this is giving me a good lower bound on my number of edges. Okay, this argument is um, using what I was saying earlier, you kind of do this eigenvector eigenvalue equation where I'm counting walks of length two, so for A squared. And there are kind of two types of walks of length two. I can kind of walk from my vertex and go outside of my neighborhood, or I can kind of walk from my vertex and go inside of my neighborhood. Um, when I do the eigenvector, when, when I'm counting the paths of length two, basically this, edge gets walked on twice. I can go this way or I can go this way. Whereas this edge gets walked on only once when I do the pass of length two. There's only one way to do this, to have this edge be in a, in a walk of length two for my vertex. And so that's sort of where this number of triangles is coming from. That's why it comes into this, uh, this theorem. Um, I'll say that this theorem implies a, uh, uh, it implies Mantel's theorem, stronger than Mantel's theorem. I mean, it implies maybe, maybe Stanley's theorem as well, but, but it, it implies uh, Mantel's theorem. Um, and it's tight for certain cases of graphs. So, so this, this theorem is best possible. Um, now, in our specific cases, I'm gonna use this to show that I have a very good lower bound. So, so this lambda one squared is at least n squared over four. That's from our lower bound on, on the spectral radius. And now, because um, our graphs, like what are they forbidding? If I have, if I'm forbidding a friendship graph, that means I'm forbidding a matching in the neighborhood of any vertex, a matching of size K. So that means there can't be very many edges in the neighborhood of a vertex. That means there aren't very many triangles. If I'm forbidding a W uh, 2K plus one, there's no cycle of length 2K in the neighborhood by the even circuit bound um, even circuit theorem, there are not too many edges in the neighborhood, and this means there's not very many triangles. So in particular, there are subcubically many triangles. So you can use um, you can use the triangle removal lemma. Um, yeah, this is this is what's if if I think about this as adding edges to a complete bipartite graph, this is what I'm not allowed to add in the part. So if I really knew that my graph was complete bipartite then I'm not allowed to add these, these things in the parts. Um, the, the details, the hard part is showing that this intuition is really correct. So like here, here I'm just, uh, I just know that I have a large maximum cut. It's not necessarily a complete bipartite graph. And so 
to to show that really the graph mostly looks like this that that's where the details are oh and i'll say you can you can use um there's a stability theorem with you so you're kind of using um the triangle removal lemma and the stability theorem of Fioretti that says um, if you have close to n squared over four edges and you have no triangle, then there's this very large maximum cut. Um, and so I'm using the triangle removal lemma to say that I can remove a small number of edges and have a graph with no triangles, but close to n squared over four edges. And then I'm using the stability theorem of Fioretti. Um, once I know this, that sort of my graph doesn't have F and my graph has this many edges and my graph doesn't have very many triangles, then essentially like in order for that to happen, in order for you to have this very large maximum cut, well, it's not necessarily a complete bipartite yet, but it, if you take a step back, it sort of looks like that. Most of the vertices have to have close to N over two neighbors. If most of the vertices have close to n over two neighbors, then you can't really have a vertex of large internal degree. So if I have a vertex that has epsilon times n neighbors, then it's going to be adjacent to lots of these vertices, like the whole neighborhood will be adjacent to lots of these vertices. And then you can kind of embed your graph. Um, and so sort of most vertices are behaving how you want them to. And you sort of want to show that all the vertices behave how you want them to. So it's, it's kind of a progressive thing. Some, in some cases, it takes only one or two steps. And, and in, the, in the large wheel case, like it's, it's pretty hard to show this. You kind of have to progressively get closer and closer to your graph over several different steps. Um, so, but, but essentially, you sort of slowly make your way to the, to the part where like all the vertices are essentially behaving how you want to. If all of the vertices are behaving how you want to, so every vertex kind of does not have very many neighbors in its own part and has most of the neighbors in the other part, then you, if you know that much about your graph, then you know a lot about your eigenvector as well. So you can, like the graph right now, it essentially looks close to regular. And what that means is that the, the eigenvector should be close to the constant vector. Uh, a regular graph, a graph is regular if and only if its first eigenvector is the all one sector. And so this is saying, well, my graph is close to regular, so the first eigenvector should be close to the all one sector. So, so in particular, you can sort of show that they're all, yeah, they're all very close to each other. And now, yeah, completing the proof, usually you can do it, um, or you can, yeah, you, you can usually do it. So basically, in the cases that you are showing that the spectral extremal graph and the edge extremal graph are the same, um, basically the idea is that, okay, well, all the vertices are looking the same, which means that the eigenvector is constant. And that means when I look at this, so if, if the eigenvector was actually constant, then when I look at this quadratic form, it's equivalent to counting edges, right? If, if it's constant, each sum and is the same. Um, if the eigenvector is close to constant, then this quadratic form, well, it's almost the same as counting edges. And if, you know, if that, if uh, if almost is really very close, then then uh, then uh, I can't have fewer edges and, and be spectral extreme. So so if if the if these two if these two functions are really close enough, so this quadratic function and the number of edges, if they're really that close, then they they have to be the same. Okay, so um, this is kind of big picture how these proofs go. Um, I mean, the the even the one where the, uh, the the spectral extremal and the edge extremal graphs are disjoint, it still actually satisfies this thing where where the the eigenvector is close to constant, but um, you know for whatever reason it's it. Uh, it's not quite the same as counting edges, so so it's not it's not always straightforward when you get to there. It's, you know, it, it's not always the same problem. Okay, so what do we do next? Um, you know, other forbidden graphs, of course. So like this, this I mean, this is a very general type of question. Um, I there are there are lots of open problems like the you know the Mickey Forest conjecture about C two K free graphs. I think that's a very nice question. Um, and any any question where we know the, the family of, of uh, edge extremal graphs, it would be nice to ask, well, is it the same as the spectral extremal case or, or not? I think both answers are interesting when they're the same or when they're not. 
Um, one thing is our, uh, our technical lemma about getting the large maximum cut, that really only works when K is two. So, so this counting um, here, when we did this counting, this theorem is tight in certain cases, but if you try to do the same thing in a graph that essentially looks three parts height or larger, um, these graphs essentially look five parts height and the counting tight. If you have basically, if you have a graph that has a lot of triangles, so if I have cubically many triangles, then something is going wrong. Here. So we sort of need a version of this theorem that um, is tight when your graph is essentially three parts height or larger. Uh, okay, so so yeah, we we don't know how to do this. I suspect though the rest of the method works, like I, all of kind of the big picture why it works. It should still work. Um, we don't know what's happening when you add linearly many edges. So that was the case with both, with all the wheels. You're adding linearly many edges to a complete bipartite graph. And in some cases, it's the same as the Turing graph. In some cases, the families are disjoint. So um, I'm not really sure what's going on here. I don't really understand. I think it would be very nice to investigate, say, what, what do KSSS3 graphs look like? Um, that, that would be a nice question. And then there's this last question. This is sort of just an annoying thing. Um, we don't know what's happening with W9 and W11. We still kind of know that they roughly look extremal, but um, let's say in the W9 case, I, we can't really rule out the case that our graphs kind of looks like this, uh, uh, triangles on one side and a match on the other. Um, I mean, it, it, if you compare the spectral radius of this graph to the spectral radius of the graph we actually think is extremal, which is K4s on this side and one edge on the other. If you compare these, this one wins, this one wins, but it's, it's very close, okay? And so because it's so close, um, there's not a lot of room for error when we're kind of doing this, um, this cleaning up of our graph and this kind of getting closer and closer to, the, to what we think is the extremal graph. There's, there's not a lot of room to make mistakes there. And so we, we kind of can't quite show that it actually should be this, um, even though it probably is. Okay, so that's where I want to stop. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, if we could all thank our speaker in some way, and then uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for some questions. Do we have any questions for our speaker? Yes, I, I got a question for you. Um, so you said a couple of slides back, right, that the um, you get a nearly constant eigenvector for the extremal graph. It wasn't clear to me under what circumstances that happens or that you even expect that to happen. Yeah, I, I don't have a good general answer for you. Um, in all of these cases that we've been able to do this, uh, at this point, we know a lot about the structure. So, so in every case where we've been able to, to say something like this, it's like the graph is little o n squared edges away from a Turan graph. Um, and so at that point, you can say, uh, you can say the, the, uh, the eigenvector is close to constant. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a question I don't know how to answer in general. Like I don't, I can't give you a kind of structural theorem um, if your graph has this structure, then the, then the eigenvector is close to constant. I think that's a that's a really nice question, but it's um, it's hard to figure out how to say something like that. I guess it's it's close to the question of when I mean the, the edge version, right? So the when when does the extremal graph or the the um, maximal number of edges when is that uh, nearly regular or something? And I guess is that not that's not well understood. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's like sort of if, if you, if you fix any forbidden graph and kind of think about what's happening, you might, you can usually deduce whether the graph is going to be close to regular or very far from regular, but, um, how to do it in general, I don't, I don't know. Um, and th they're definitely related questions, but it's also not clear to me that 
there. The same question, right? Like you can have a, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not clear to me what exactly is controlling the eigenvector entries. Um, yeah. Do we have any other questions for Mike? Okay, if not, thanks again, Mike. And thanks everybody for making it out and have a good weekend, everybody. Okay, thanks for listening. Thank you.